Joining me now, a skeptic, I think we can call him, of the Saudi-Israel mega deal, Democratic Senator Chris Murphy of Connecticut. He sits on the Foreign Relations Committee and is chairman of the subcommittee on the Middle East. He wrote a letter with 19 fellow Senate Democrats this week to President Biden raising concerns about such a deal. Senator, thanks for coming back on the show. Let us say President Biden decides to go forward with this deal between Saudi Arabia and Israel involving the normalization of relations, mutual defense pact, civil nuclear energy program. And it's a formal treaty that requires two-thirds support in the Senate. Would you vote for that? Well, way too early to know. We, there are so many moving pieces in these negotiations that there's no way for any of us to declare how we would vote until we see the scope of the agreement. You are right to label me a skeptic. Um, but I see both p potential benefits to U.S. security from an agreement like this, but also real risks. It is clear that U.S. policy is to try to heal divisions between Israel and its neighbors. Uh, that would be positive for the United States, uh, of course, we have an interest in a Palestinian state and getting Israel committed back to a path to a Palestinian state. That's on the table in these negotiations. China is um, obviously a big player today in the Middle East and trying to make sure that countries like Saudi Arabia are aligned with us rather than China, which is on the table in these negotiations, is important as well. But you properly identified some pretty massive downsides. Um, I think it'll be a very difficult sell to the American public and to Congress to commit U.S. troops to the defense of the Saudi Arabia regime that has been very aggressive in its military tactics around the region. Uh, and I think without so, real movement in Israel on the Palestinian question, it will also be hard to get broad bipartisan consensus. And those were the concerns that we were laying out in this letter yes. that 20 senators sent to the administration. So I'll come back to Israel in a moment, just sticking with Saudi. I take your point that it's too early to say what's in the deal. But, I mean, technically, you could say, look, I'm not for it, right? I'm not for the idea of this deal, even though the principle of peace is great, because it requires, in some shape or form, a military alliance or pact or agreement with Saudi Arabia. And I wonder, we, we mentioned earlier, a Harris poll shows the majority of Americans, 55 percent, oppose a deal, especially one that involves sending troops to die effectively for MBS. We're not willing to send troops to fight in Ukraine, but we would be willing to send troops to fight for a kingdom where people are sentenced to death for tweeting. Well, and this is also a kingdom that has not demonstrated the kind of restraint that you yes. would like to see from a defense partner. Remember, there are two ways that a defense guarantee can go. Um, one, it can bind you closer together and you end up making joint security decisions, or it can embolden your partner. If without a U.S. security guarantee, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, the leader of uh, Saudi Arabia, was kidnapping neighboring prime ministers, invading Yemen and bombing yeah. civilians, what will he do knowing that the United States has his unequivocal back in all of those uh, military adventures? So I think that's a very big risk that we have to talk about. It's why I think there would be much, it would be much easier to find consensus in the Senate on an agreement with Saudi Arabia and Israel that didn't commit us to a binding defense treaty. There, there are other ways, perhaps, to increase our defense relationship with Saudi Arabia, again, as part of a comprehensive uh, uh, agreement and, that would be more palatable. And the idea of MBS possibly starting a war and then us having to defend him is, is bizarre. Just on the civil nuclear energy program that the Saudis are very keen on, uh, it's what you raised in your letter, concerns, obvious concerns about that. You and I have spoken about the Iran nuclear deal many a time on this show. You and I would like to see the United States back in some form of deal with Iran. In what world do we carry on persuading the Iranians not to go nuclear in a weapons way if they think the Saudis are about to do that? Right. And, and what do the Saudis want as part of this agreement? They want the ability to enrich uranium and control the production of uranium domestically, something that we do not allow nations to do historically that are building civilian nuclear programs. As you know, I have long been concerned about um, arms races in the Middle East. It's why I have you know, repeatedly uh, opposed um, new massive arms sales to Saudi Arabia, because I think that ends up just fueling the Iranians to match that escalation. The same thing can be said of a civilian 
nuclear arms race if the Saudis have the ability to enrich. How on earth will you convince the, uh, the Iranians to dial back their program? It's why this letter specifically called for the gold standard to apply to Saudi Arabia, which does not typically involve Saudi Arabia being able, a country subject to that standard, to be able to enrich uranium. They would get the uranium from some other country that is already doing enrichment. Have a listen to what then-candidate Joe Biden said about Saudi Arabia on the debate stage in 2019. Khashoggi was, in fact, murdered and dismembered, and I believe in the order of the Crown Prince. And I would make it very clear, we were not going to, in fact, sell more weapons to them. We were going to, in fact, make them pay the price and make them, in fact, the pariah that they are. There's very little social redeeming value of the, in the present uh, government in Saudi Arabia. That was your party leader saying we were going to make Saudi Arabia a pariah. And yet four years later, we are selling the Saudis weapons, we're doing fist bumps and handshakes, and we're on the verge of this mega deal. I would argue that if Donald Trump was doing what Joe Biden is doing, Democrats would be up in arms over that. Well, I, I don't think that I've been shy in my opposition to the administration's policy towards Saudi Arabia. Uh, in fact, I've been part, as I mentioned, of efforts to try to overturn some of these sales, uh, because I think, think it speaks to a real broader concern at this moment. Um, listen, if you do believe that the fight of the next 50 years is between American democracy and Chinese or Russian-styled autocracy, then you have to walk the walk, not just talk yes. the talk when it comes to democracy and human rights. It gets really hard to convince people to be part of your coalition if they see us continually cutting deals with the Saudis or the Egyptians or the Tunisians. And so somewhere along the way, we've got to stand up for our values. And I think we had an opportunity to do that early on with Saudi Arabia. We didn't. And I think that ultimately we pay a price for that dissonance between the way we talk about democracy and then the way we engage with some of these brutal regimes. And as you mentioned, Saudi Arabia has shown no interest in political reform, most recently locking up someone who was mildly critical of the regime on Twitter, the guy had eight Twitter followers. Nobody was listening to him, but that shows you how they brook absolutely no dissent inside Saudi Arabia. Weird we haven't heard from the owner of Twitter whose second biggest investors are Saudis. Weird that. Uh, let me ask you this, Senator. In 2020, you introduced a resolution to stop weapon sales to the UAE. And on the website, formerly known as Twitter, you wrote the UAE's recognition of Israel is a big deal. I fully support the Abraham Accords, but there was no invisible ink in that deal that obligated the U.S. to compromise our own security by selling wildly lethal weapons in the Middle East. And, that, and that's good that you said that, but isn't the real problem the actual Abraham Accords that everyone loves, but which are fundamentally anti-democratic because they were signed by governments who don't speak for their own people. The polling suggests that people in the UAE and the Bahrain don't support those accords. So it's all very well for the US government to go around saying, look at these deals we've done. But they're deals with dictators. Well, but Egypt, excuse me, but Israel doesn't get to pick their neighbors. So what is, what is the logical extension of that argument, that Israel and the United States shouldn't seek peace agreements with Israel's neighbors simply because they're dictatorships? Israel has to live in the neighborhood that it lives in, and it is a U.S. national security priority to secure the state of, uh, of Israel. So I don't necessarily, listen, I want these countries to reform politically, but I also don't think we can argue that Israel should stand down or the United States should stand down in negotiating with these countries, even if they're run by brutal dictators. The, the world is the world. And while we can be stronger in our efforts to reform, Israel um, has, to, has to live with the I consequences guess, of not being at peace with I, these countries. I understand that point. I guess the point is, if these countries were democracies, they wouldn't be doing these deals. And we just both agreed a moment ago that we would likely see these countries uh, being democracies. Let's talk about Israel before we run out of time. You've got Prime Minister Netanyahu showing maps at the UN that literally have wiped Palestine off the map. There's no Palestinian territories. Members of his government are open racists and fascists. And yet both the United States Congress and the White House continue to coddle Israel, arm Israel, fund Israel. We're letting Israel join the visa waiver program. Will the U.S. government ever hold Israel to account for anything? Well, that's why I think this agreement is a real 
opportunity. Um, I, listen, I am deeply worried about the fact that we are really close to losing any future ability for the Palestinians to have a nation of their own. And I think that's really bad for Israel. In fact, it, it may ultimately be the end of a Jewish state in the Middle East. And so this is the moment where we can use this agreement and these negotiations to uh, help get Israel back on a true path towards a Palestinian state. Now. It is not likely that this government, right, um, with people like Ben Gavir and Smotrich as part of it, will be able to deliver on the commitments that we need for a future Palestinian state. And so, in the end, um, this agreement may end up putting the question to the Israeli people. Um, do you want this government today, which is marching you away from democracy and away from a two-state future, or um, do you support the terms of the agreement, which gets you peace with Saudi Arabia, but also requires you to do some hard things on the Palestinian question. I think that may be a question that can be put after this agreement is, is, is signed. The new Senate Foreign Relations Chair Ben Cardin has held back over $200 million in U.S. military aid to Egypt over human rights concerns, which is something I know you've raised in the past. It's ironic because he's only the new chair because your colleague, Senator Robert Menendez, had to stand down from the chairmanship after being indicted over corruption and bribery allegations involving Egypt, claims he denies. But the DOJ indictment, Senator, does seem to suggest the Egyptian government had financial sway over the Democratic chair of the Foreign Relations Committee. That is a huge scandal, is it not? And shouldn't Egypt be held to account for that? So, uh, I believe that we shouldn't be transferring this money to Egypt, separate and aside from the question of what Senator Menendez did. This is a country that has tens of thousands of political prisoners that is just as brutal in its treatment of political dissent as Saudi Arabia is, and they get more direct U.S. taxpayer finance, uh, military financing than any country in the world except for Israel. But. You are right that the indictment of Senator Menendez raises real questions about um, whether, is, whether Egypt has been surreptitiously trying to run an influence campaign on the Foreign Relations Committee. And I, I don't think we should be sending money to Egypt right now, given their human rights record, at least this $235 million. But I also think we need to get those questions answered about exactly what kind of influence, influence operation they were running on us, the United States Senate. When you read the line in the indictment about Menendez allegedly texting the number of personnel at the U.S. Embassy in Cairo to an Egyptian government source via intermediaries, that must have shocked you. That's, that's endangering the lives, potentially, of U.S. personnel abroad, is it not? You know, as you said, Senator Menendez asserts his innocence and has not yet you know, provided a fact-by-fact fact rebuttal, and so I will wait to hear his side of the story here. But yes, of course, that allegation, amongst many others, is uh, absolutely shocking. One last question. You've got to go. Very quick one. Kevin McCarthy gone. Jim Jordan, possible next House Speaker, with a government shutdown looming in 43 days. Is U.S. congressional funding for Ukraine over now? Is there no hope of getting any money to Ukraine out of this House and the next GOP House Speaker? Well, I, I just shudder to think of that as the outcome of these negotiations. This is, I think, one of the most important decisions the United States Congress will make in a 25-year period if we lose Ukraine, if Kyiv becomes a Russian city. Um, I think the world looks fundamentally different 25, 50 years from now, and we'll rue the day that we walked away from supporting Ukraine. Uh, listen, there's a big uh, tranche of uh, pro-Ukraine Republicans in the House who could simply insist that they are not going to vote for a speaker that is going to abandon Ukraine. And that could be a Republican speaker, or that could be a Republican speaker that is working in coordination with Democrats. But this question of whether the result of this election is going to result in uh, Russia owning all of Ukraine, it's probably going to be up to a handful of allegedly pro-Ukraine Republicans in the House, and it'll be uh, up to them uh, as to chart the course forward. We will continue to pass Ukraine aid in the Senate. We have a bipartisan yeah. majority. We can get that passed, but we need it passed in the House as well. So what you're saying is you need Republicans to do the right thing. Good luck there. Senator Chris Murphy, always appreciate you taking time out for these conversations. Thank you for your time.